thank you, God. It's such an amazing day out there, right? It was really good. God, you're good this morning. We thank you for who you are and what you're doing in this place. You are kind and you are just. You are honourable. Open up the skies of mercy. Oh 
Thanksgiving is a weapon. Yeah. It's a tool in our hands to drive back the enemy. Yeah. Now the psalmist says, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter his courts with praise. There's a link between praise and thanksgiving. And even yeah. science is catching up now. And studies have shown that actually practicing gratitude helps with the mental neural chemistry of our pathways of our brain. Thank you, science, for catching up with the word of God yeah. that declared <laughs> that it's good to give thanks, to be joyful. So just as the, as the band continues to play, just put thanksgiving on your lips. Just begin to give thanks to God in this week and in this world of, of tumult. And, and, you know, we there's so much going on. Thanksgiving is our weapon. So we thank you, Lord. Just begin to give thanks. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for all of your glory. We thank you for your creation. We thank you for the wonders, Lord, of your hands that we see in the, in, the, in, the, in the world around us, in the sky, Lord, in the trees, in the birds of the air. Father, we thank you for this new day. It's a new creation. You've invited us into the redemptive strategy on your heart today, and we thank you for considering us, Lord, by your, the blood of your son, Jesus. You consider us worthy to partner with you in what you're doing in the world today. We thank you. We thank you for one another. We thank you for church family. We thank you for relationships. We thank you for the love that you place in our hearts, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, even, even in times of grief and sorrow and brokenness, Lord, that those are times there that actually propel us toward your heart and show us more of your love and more of your character. And so we invite you, Lord God. We thank you even for all the seasons, Lord God. We give you thanks. We give you praise. Because you are always good. Whether we understand it or not, you are always good. It's who you are. And so we give you thanks. And we choose this day to enter into your courts with thanksgiving. We choose to enter your gates with praise because you are worthy and you are good. Amen. Thank you. 
turn it for our good. You turn it for our good. For your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. Working for our good. You are working for our good. For your glory. Even when the
me read from Isaiah 42. This weekend in the synagogue, Isaiah 42 and 43 were read, as well as some wonderful chapters of the creation in Genesis. And in those verses in Genesis, it not only speaks of creation, but it speaks of the, the trauma between Cain and Abel and the birth pangs that come of God reinvesting himself into a humanity who have lost its way. We're seeing that unfold before us today. And it's rippling right around the globe from Israel to the farthest reaches of the earth. But I find it interesting, and this is where we play our role, brothers and sisters. You who are saved, who are saved by faith in, in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. You love the God of Israel. You love this book. But in the synagogue, they begin from Isaiah 42 and verse 5, 1 through 4, read like this. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. and He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, do justice in the earth today, yes. mighty God, with perfect justice, perfect mercy, perfect compassion, perfect strength, perfect resolve, mighty God, that your first chosen people, Israel, will know that you are faithful once again, Hallelujah. once again. Be a comfort to the mourning and the grieving, mighty God, and strength to those who are called to fight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. This scripture has been on my mind for a long time. Psalm 68 speaks of the worshippers going ahead of the battle, the singers, the musicians, and the dancers. Psalm 68 also says at the end of the psalm, Psalm 68, 34 and 35, might be 35 or 36, but read it if you can. Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel, and whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God in his sanctuary. It is he who gives power and strength to his people. Listening to Joel a couple of weeks ago, and they were talking. He was talking about the days of days of awe, and um, where Israel was commanded or commanded to um, to rejoice in in situations that were impossible. Just um, it was such a challenge to to imagine being commanded to do something to to joyfully rejoice in who God is and. What he's doing in a in a place like Auschwitz and it was such a such a challenge and so I, I that's why I chose this song. But yeah, thank you, God. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the storm, louder and louder. 
joined on me all morning since we started singing about Thanksgiving, about singing thanks to the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God gave me a revelation this morning because I'm going through some turmoil stages. We give thanks and we pray to the Lord of God, to the God of all. In the midst of our enemies, in the midst of our battles, because this is God's will for us. What we're going through, it sucks. But right at the end, on top of that hill, right in front of our eyes, if we keep a gaze, is the cross of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus that poured out for our sins to bring glory and testify to the goodness of God. So no matter what you're facing, stand along with God. Keep Him in the midst of your view. Luke, why don't you come share? Yeah, make yourself look good, buddy. I know it's tough. I just shared with Joel, I've been a born again for maybe 10 years now, and I still haven't seen the goodness of God. You know, I've seen it, I've seen it, but I feel like I have a lot to learn. Because I look at some of the more mature people in this fellowship, and I see they're still smiling, and I'm still struggling with what's going on. And I really felt like God said that as much as he's going to give a lesson to his enemies of his judgment, he's going to give us, his people, a lesson of his goodness. Amen. Amen. And this is something unique to the body of Christ where we get to reconcile joy and sorrow at the very same time. And I know as much as we determine, we stand into the grace of God this morning, we declare his praise and his faithfulness and his beauty and his constancy and his power. At the same time you're sobbing in here. And I know I am. It, it, it just surprised me for a minute just in this, in this last chorus, raise a hallelujah. All of a sudden, from nowhere, I'm sobbing here. It came and it went. This is what we get to do, brothers and sisters. We get to make whole the things that are broken. We get to bring joy and sorrow into the mix and put them into the fist of the Redeemer God who translates it for his glory and our good and the blessing of all mankind. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, why don't you uh, give somebody a big hug? and celebrate the goodness of God.
Uh, can I just invite the youth leaders and the youth from Friday night who've got the pictures to come up the front? And yeah, Kaya, can you grab Luke from in the kids church? Can you get Luke from the kids church? Josh and Beck, do you want to join us up here? Yeah. Maybe if all of the teen church want to come up here for a second too. Everybody that was at youth on Friday night and all the teen church, you guys want to come up? Hey, while they're doing that, I just want to let you know some of the things that we're teaching your children. <laughs> because we don't really get to share it in this forum very much, but it just kind of sits really well here about the goodness of God. Um, as some of you know that we had Donna De Silva come and speak a little while ago on shifting atmospheres. Uh, and so we, we felt it very pertinent to actually make this term at teen church and at uh, youth on Friday nights uh, really about shifting atmospheres. And so that's, that's about us dialing in and really getting, um, I guess, some discernment for what's happening around us. And, you know, the kids have been sharing some of the things that are a little bit tricky at school and some of the, the atmospheres that are there, stuff that's at home, stuff with, with their friends. Um, and so on Friday night, we had a prophetic worship night, and so Brum was kind enough to come and lead us, and Renee White came and led us in some creative ministry. <laughs> and so, um, so, so we ended up with like making, making pictures, uh, some of them with Bible verses, and um, we realized that it was God speaking to us, but in the middle of the process, I'm kind of like, actually, I don't think that these pictures are for us. I think this goodness is God speaking to us and learning to dial in with him so that we can hear what he wants us to declare into spaces. But then it's actually more than that. And then it's an opportunity through this creative expression to actually then pass this on to somebody else. Uh, and so we, we're actually going to take a bit of a risk here and we're going to invite the kids to actually just ask God and look at you and ask him to tell us who these pictures are for. And just as we were sharing about the goodness of God before, that's what, that's what we're hoping. We want to impart heaven to you. We want to impart Jesus to you through this little uh, prophetic act of sharing. Um, so if you guys want to grab your pictures. Uh, and is Beck still there? Is Beck West out there, Josh? She can come and do hers as well. Yeah. So I'm just going to get Luke to share with you uh, like the process of him getting the picture and the download from God and then the meaning of his picture. Yeah. My picture is the tree of life. Um, I asked God what would be under the tree and he said a frog. And the frogs have a life cycle. And I did butterflies too because they have life cycles too. So, yeah. So as you give this to somebody else, what do you think it might mean? Um, I don't know. <laughs> That's good. Uh, Evie, would you like to share about yours? Um, this was just like, I don't know, he is our light, so I did like a sun in the darkness. And so we're hoping as we share these with you now and get the, like, so we're actually going to look around the room and we're going to ask um, Holy Spirit to show us who these pictures are for and then we'll come and give them to you and uh, then we'll hand, move into what we're doing next. But even as we share these with individual people, we pray that you are blessed too in the process. Like God's moving with us. He's speaking to us. And so you might not get a picture today uh, from us, but I pray that you get a picture or a word from him. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 
Yep. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Owen. It's true. It's true. It may seem foolish to us at the time or even to the, to the kids handing them out, but uh, God is powerful and he loves working through those offerings that are, that are innocent and transparent and true. Thank you, Jesus. And God's word is transparent and true. And the very scripture that, that I began with this morning, I just want to share briefly, and then I know Stu has a burden on his heart too, because we want to get into some prayer this morning for our elder brother Israel. And uh, um, Eve reminded me this morning of so many, so many times when we've taught here at Flame Tree that what Israel endures physically, the church experiences spiritually. That has been true historically from the very beginning until today. And so you ask yourself, what is Israel enduring? Not, not as... Uh, not so that we can uh, trans, you know, transfer it and make it all about us, but it gives us, it gives us a heads up. It gives us, it gives us uh, warning. It gives us clarity, transparency, understanding regarding what God will put in front of us. And if Israel was taken, as it were, off guard a week ago, is it also true that the church has been off guard and that we have ceded territory that ought not to have been ceded to the enemy and now are required to take it back. And we're seeing that in the, in the voting that's been going on, in the elections in New Zealand. We're seeing, it, we're seeing it all over the place where God is shaking what seemed unshakable and God is taking back proper territory um, for his own purposes in ways that we can understand. Sometimes he's so gracious because very often God is always at work doing profound and marvelous things but we're just too thick-headed and small-minded to see it, let alone understand it. But occasionally God says, oh, I've got to encourage my bride. And so he brings us in on what he's doing, and we can begin to see clearly. Let me just, let me just move on from there. You remember I read from Isaiah 42, the first five verses that are left out of the reading in the synagogue. But if you go on in, in Isaiah 42 and 43 that, are, that were read just yesterday in the synagogue, let me just uh, beg your, your patience as I read a few of these verses. Thus says the Lord God, who created the heavens and straight stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. Oh, may it be, God, that the hostages will be a literal response to your word here. You've said, Father, you will lead out the prisoners. Let it be, God, miraculously, sovereignly, astonishingly. Let the nations be put on their heels because of what you do in this hour. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and all those who dwell on them. Let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voices, the settlements where Kedar inhabits. Let the inhabitants of Selah sing aloud. Let them sing for joy from the tops of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands as we have done this morning. The Lord will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. And then verse 14, remarkable. God says, I have kept silent for a long time. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now, like a woman in labor, I will groan. I will both gasp and pant. And we've seen labor pains of the most grievous nature. 
I will lay waste the mountains and hills and wither all their vegetation. I will make the rivers into coastlands and dry up the ponds. I will lead the blind by a way they do not know. In paths they do not know, I will guide them. I will make darkness into light before them and rugged places into plains. These are the things I will do and I will not leave them undone. They will be turned back and utterly put to shame who trust in idols who say to molten images, you are our gods. And finally, at the end of chapter 43, all the nations have gathered together so that the people may be assembled. Who among them can declare this and proclaim to us the former things? Let them present their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed, and there is no strange God among you. So you are my witnesses, declares the Lord. I am God. Even from eternity, I am he. And there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act. And who can reverse it? Amen. Amen. Come on, Stu. Thank you, Joel. Well, this morning, again, we find ourselves here on another Sunday morning, and I just felt it wasn't the morning to just to bring another message or a sermon for teaching's sake, um, but really to just to stop and pause in the moment and to you know, take stock, reflect on what God is doing across the globe, in Israel in particular. And as Joel said, what Israel is experiencing in the physical, expect that we can experience in the spiritual as well. And many of you are probably coming from a week of massive spiritual attack. If things seemed heavier and more burdensome and more thick and heavy this week in your life, in situations, in, in circumstances, then don't be surprised. Don't be caught off guard. Um, that's the nature of what we're dealing with, and that's the nature of our partnership in the kingdom to actually engage in this spiritual battle that we're a part of. And so I just want to share some thoughts just for the next little while on, on how we might navigate our time, our lives, our posture uh, in these times. And we will get to some prayer shortly. I'm going to speak specifically on, on prayer uh, at the close of this little, little thing. But I guess this morning, I, I want us to be trained. Um, don't take this as some, some teaching or some good ideas or some good thoughts. But really, um, hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you through his word and consider how you might put it into practice. Yeah? We're called not to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And, uh, and it is a season, God has been speaking to us so much about us being trained and equipped as a body of people for these days that we live in and for the days ahead. So this morning, I just want to bring you some thoughts from the Word. I'm actually indebted to some teaching from Bill Johnson through some of these thoughts as well. But it's really just on the subject of strengthening yourself in the Lord. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. How many know that that's actually... Um, our, um, it's, it's not just our privilege, but it actually becomes part of our responsibility as believers who carry this identity as ones who are saved, ones who are redeemed, children of the Most High, that it's not, it's not just for us and, it's not, and we're, not, um, we're not given over to our emotions or to our feelings per se or to circumstances, but we have a responsibility for our own sake, for our family's sake, for our church, for our, our nation, for the bride of Christ, to learn how to stand strong. <laughs> yep. And when the going gets tough, how to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. And really, I'm taking um, that, that phrase would be familiar to you. You know the story in 1 Samuel 30 when David and his mighty men are off fighting. They're actually fighting with the Philistines, but the Philistines send them back to their camp and they find that the Amalekite, Amalekites have raided their camp and taken off all the women and children and all their possessions, they've, they've basically just taken off. And it says that David's men wanted to 
basically stone him and do him in. Like they weren't happy with their leader. And it says, it's just so poignant, that David strengthened himself in the Lord. He stopped. He sought the Lord. He, he came into the Lord's presence to receive strength for that hour and what to do next. And we know that story that he went and pursued and nothing that had been taken um, was, was lost. Everything was regathered, yeah, redeemed. And so, um, yeah, I just want to share some of these thoughts. And again, just to... Just as a starting point, Psalm 18, verse 1 to 3, which is a psalm of David. It begins like this. It says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. And we'll just pause right there. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. When we hear these words and we read these words of David's personal experience millennia ago, words that are recited by our Jewish brothers and sisters right now, owning these promises of God, the strength of God, and also words that we can take for our, our own as well. This is our story as well as those who have been grafted into the family of God through Yeshua, our Messiah. He is our rock. He is our shield. He is our strength. And so we strengthen ourselves in the Lord. And the first thing I want to I speak on, <laughs> interestingly enough, is thanksgiving and the, the Lord's already taken us there this morning and that you know to give thanks to give um, to be gratitude to be grateful in the moment is actually a weapon that the Lord has given us a tool in our arsenal to push back uh, the forces of darkness just simply giving thanks stopping and, and counting your blessings As I said before, it's, it's even in, in mental health circles, it's recognised as a key tool. Psychologists, counsellors use it. Practice gratitude, practice thanksgiving. Jesse's already read these words, but this is, again, let me read them for you from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You know, in a, in a world where so many believers are getting themselves tied up in knots, you know, seeking to know what the will of God for their lives is. Actually, it's pretty clear here. It begins with giving thanks. Let me read it again. Okay. Give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If you're wondering what God's will is for your life, Start by giving thanks. God, I thank you for what you've already given. I thank you for all the many blessings that you have bestowed upon my life. Count them. Name them. Set them out. Now, James says, consider it pure joy, my brethren, when you face trials of every kind. In, in a sense, this is also accounting. Count it pure joy when you face trials of every, every kind. There's something rich and deep in there that even when we go through trials, that we can actually count that and give thanks to God. God, I thank you for this trial and for this hardship that I'm facing right now. Because what well, I believe that you're a good God and that you will get your will. You will get your purpose. You will get redemption through this trial. You will wrought, wrought within me uh, the character of Jesus through this trial. And so I count it pure joy. I consider it a gift, Lord. This is how we fight our battles. This is how we strengthen ourselves in the Lord. Taking our eyes off the situation, off the circumstances, and actually begin to start thanking God for it. Now, I'm no, by no means am I dismissing you know, heavy 
you know, events of trauma or abuse or difficulty in anyone's life. Please don't, don't hear me wrong there. I'm not dismissing. But as we are called and as we are named and as we receive the Father's love in real time, I believe that the Bible's clear that we can, we can actually come to a point where even in that brokenness and even in that trial and that trauma, not discarding it for a second, but actually not having, a, having it identify us anymore. But actually our identity is as a redeemed and loved son and daughter of the Most High. And so, Lord, even in the mystery and even in the sheer difficulty, and I don't understand it, and this is, this is really, really hard, but I will fix my eyes on you. I will give thanks to you, God, for you are good. Johnson writes, when you give thanks, the weapon the enemy meant to use to dislodge you from your divine purpose is put into your hands and becomes the very thing that brings you more fully into that purpose. Yeah. Becomes a weapon. Yeah. Utilised for the purposes of God over our lives when we give thanks. We're called to commune with God, getting God's presence. How do we strengthen ourselves in our Lord? We give thanks and we commune with him. We commune with him. Uh, this speaks of a sustained focus. What does Hebrews 12, 2 says? It says that we fix our eyes on Jesus. We look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, or the originator and the perfecter of our faith. If you are going through trials right now, if you are tempted to turn your eyes, avert your eyes, and be distracted by the events of the world, you need to commune with, with Jesus. You need to be in his presence. You need to get alone with him. Fix your eyes. Refix your eyes on him. Call upon him. Get to know his names. That's one of the things the Lord was teaching me earlier this year is actually look at the names of God in Scripture so that when you do come into his presence in prayer, you, you call by him by his names. He's El Shaddai. He's Yahweh. He's Elohim. He's Elohe Yisrael, the God of Israel. He's the Kadosh Yisrael, the Holy One of Israel. He is Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. He is Adonai. Get to know him. Get to know his names and come into his presence and commune with him. Be still and know that I am God. We, we, the Lord took us to that verse last week. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted over the earth. So commune with him. Can I also say, we strengthen ourselves in the Lord, not only when we yeah, give thanks, when we commune with him, spend time in his presence, but actually that we, we, we give him praise. Yeah. You know, praise is one of those tricky Christian words that so many of us refrain from doing because we're not feeling it. You know, uh, it doesn't feel genuine or authentic for me to praise God right now because my mind hasn't been on him or I haven't been reading the word or I haven't been thinking about him lately. And so I feel like a hypocrite if I, if I start praising God. Actually, the opposite is true. <laughs> if you're a believer, yeah, then praise looks like obedience then, whether you feel it or not. Yeah? And so we practice obedience by giving him praise. I will enter his courts with thanksgiving. I will enter his gates with praise. And so we intentionally strengthen ourselves in the Lord by intentionally declaring praise. Now, praise is, is basically just exalting God for, for who he is and what he's done and what he's going to do. It can, be, it can be very spiritual or it can be very normal as well. God, I give you praise for the sunshine today. I just noticed the shade of green on the leaves of that tree. And I give you praise. That is marvellous. What a wonder. I give you praise when I see the, the faces of my children and, and grandchildren and the way that Ben smiles. <laughs> you know, that cheeky little grin. I give you praise, Lord. Oh, you're worthy to be praised. Yep. So anything that's, that's high and lifted up right down to... I give you praise, Lord. You, I've got a park, car park here in a very full shopping centre. I praise you, Lord. You see everything. You are the giver of all good gifts, and thank you. Yeah. It, it's a shift 
from complaining and from grumbling and from bemoaning and, oh, woe is me, look at my life. It's a shift that we need to intentionally, purposefully make to praise. This is all about us getting postured and positioned to be those who strength, know how to strengthen ourselves in the Lord so that we may be useful to the Lord for the kingdom purposes in this day. Okay? So obedience through praise. The psalmist says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Sometimes our soul doesn't want to bless the Lord. And so we say, bless the Lord, O my soul. Wake, wake up. We sang that too this morning, didn't we? Awake, my soul. Bless the Lord. And so if that's you, if you're like, oh, I'm a bit slumberous today. I'm like, oh, my soul's down here. You've got to tell your soul. Yep. Yeah? You take authority from the inner man. Yeah? Partnered with the Holy Spirit. Okay, soul, wake up. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within him, me. Bless his holy name. Yep. I will be glad. Psalm 9.2 says, I will be glad. Yep. I will choose to be glad. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name. So we strengthen ourselves by practicing thanksgiving, by communion with God, by praising him, walking in obedience through praise. We strengthen ourselves in the Lord by praying in the spirit. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 2 says, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. We need to engage both our spirit and our mind when we pray. Paul says, I'll pray in the spirit, I'll also pray with my mind. There's a time for both. And sometimes words just don't suffice when we need to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. And sometimes we just need to stay still and pray in the spirit, pray in tongues. If, those are, if you haven't received the gift of tongues, then just sit quietly, sit still. Don't let your mind go, in, go to work straight away. Just sit in stillness and silence. Push back the thoughts that come, the worries or the distractions or the things that you've, you've got on for the day and just, no, discipline yourself to be still yeah. Yeah, and begin to pray in the spirit. And if, and if words come out, then words come out in the spirit. But what we're looking for there is a communion of heart, your heart with God. Pray in the spirit. How about this? Meditate on God's promises. That's what Jesus did when he was tempted. He said to the devil, he said, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We need to know the word of God. We need, we need to be familiar with the word of God, yes, but also for the word of God to get in us. And so that takes meditation on the Word of God. Now, Christian meditation is far different to Eastern meditation. Yeah? Okay, so don't freak out. Eastern meditation is all about emptying the mind. Christian meditation is all about filling the mind with the Word of God. And it might be that you just focus on one verse. You're reading the Word one day, and one verse just really speaks to you. The Lord's speaking to you. You've got to stop. And you've got to meditate on that verse or that phrase until it gets into you. This is a weapon that the Lord has given to us as we strengthen ourselves in the Lord, as we are useful in his hands in pushing back the deeds of darkness in our day. We not only know the word of God, but we meditate on the word of God, get it into us and memorize the word of God. Can I encourage you to do that? Again, it's something that the Lord has challenged me on again this year to, you know, Sunday school days. Do you remember being, you know, being at Sunday school and you got a prize, you know, for scripture a memorization, yeah, okay, I'm not the only one. As adults, we kind of let that stuff slip, but it's so powerful. Again, as you're reading the word, whatever that looks like, whether it's our daily bread or you're reading a devotion or you've just got your own Bible reading disciplines going on, again, just be attentive to when the Spirit says, stop, I want you to, I want you to focus on that. That's for you today. And take some time to, to memorize it to memorize it, to, to open up a note on your phone and write it down. Write it down so that then when later in the day, you, oh, what was that phrase again? How was it? You can look it up again really quick. Yeah. So, so start memorizing scripture. That way that when you're sitting in the, in the lights in traffic, yeah, turn the radio off, turn the noise off and start reciting scripture back to the Lord. Yeah. For, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. 
From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation and my fortress. I will not be greatly shaken. Yes, thank you, Lord. Blessed is he who keeps his mind on... No, no. See, I've forgotten now. (laughs) Blessed is he who keeps himself in perfect peace for his mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Isaiah 26, 3. Yeah, so it's okay. You'll, you'll, you'll stumble like I just did, but that's okay. Lord, what was that again? Come back to it. Memorize scripture. It's a, it's a weapon that the Lord's given to us to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. These are days at hand which we're called to do battle. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Someone's listening. <laughs> yes. Um, remember, rehearse, and retell testimonies. And we've been sharing about this of recent months. And again, I remind you that the root word of testimony in the Hebrew is ud, which means do it again. So we're rehearsing our history with God in order to build faith for our future in him. Rehearse, retell, remember testimonies. And we do that as we read the word of our own lives, what God has done, his story in our life, the history that we have with God. Remember it. When he's brought breakthrough in different areas, remember it, retell, write it down, remind God. God, you were there for me 20 years ago when I was going through this situation. I believe that you will do it again. Lord, as I read these examples in the word of God, these stories, I'm part of this family. Lord, do it again in my own circumstance. Lord, I heard a healing testimony at Flame Tree last Sunday for a situation that I'm going through right now. Lord, I want that for my own life. Do it again. This is who you are, God. This is who you are. And so we, we remember, rehearse, retell our testimonies. Yeah. Spend time with covenant people. And that doesn't mean that we, we suddenly stop spending time with outsiders. I think it's very important that we do have relationships with people who are not yet believers. In fact, I stand by that. I think that's extremely important. Because if all of our friends are just Christians, then how's the kingdom growing? How's, how are disciples being made? So yes, um, friendships across inside and outside the church. But, but, but listen carefully to what you hear Jesus said in the parable of the sower. Listen carefully to who you're around. And if, and if all of your time is spent with non-covenant people, and by, what I mean by that is that those who haven't got, yet got a revelation of the goodness of God, those who are not yet walking intimately with Jesus, or, or even those who claim that are, but they're not actually, the words that they come out, the lifestyle that they live is not actually lining up with the covenant promises of God, just be careful. Yeah. And intentionally look to spend time with those who are carrying the covenant promises of God, who are walking with the Lord. Be around people who feed yeah, your faith. Is that, is that fair enough? Yeah. yeah. I remember reading some wisdom years and years ago that, that in our life we need to have people that speak into our life. We also need people that we can speak into uh, their lives and those who are peers, those who are around us and, and we're speaking into one another's lives, encourage, encouraging each other, building one another up, spending time with covenant people, strengthens ourself in the Lord. Yeah. So we set a standard for our ears in that regard. We discern between conviction and condemnation. And we sang this morning that God's kindness leads us to repentance. Now, God will never speak with a condemning voice to his beloved children. He'll convict us when we've stepped out of line, but his kindness leads us to repentance. Godly sorrow leads us to repentance. And so discern the difference between conviction when the Holy Spirit is is putting his finger on something in your life that you need to address and condemnation, which include the lies, the accusations, the deception of the enemy. Yeah, Yeah? that's so, so important. See, one leads to life. One leads to growth. It might be a temporary, you know, little slap over the knuckles. But... God disciplines his sons yeah, because he loves us. The other condemnation will keep us down in shame, 
and degradation and fear. And so discern the difference between the two. Yeah. Receive conviction, repent, make right whatever you need to make right and come back into the glorious goodness of your father. And resist, rebuke, yeah, restrain condemnation. So that you've got nothing. You've got no place speaking into my life and I, I rebuke that lie, that accusation, that deception in Jesus' name. And, and usually, um, you, you'll know, there'll be peace attached to conviction, even though it may be difficult. The love of the Father is there through conviction, and, and you know that, oh, that I need to do something about that. Condemnation will attack your heart and will make you feel less, less than worthy. Yeah. Jesus has declared you worthy. You are worthy, full stop, by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. So anything, any attack on your heart or on your mind that's, that questions your worthiness and your acceptance to God, eh, give it a wide berth. Yeah. Yeah. Get back into the presence of God, commune with him, fix your eyes on Jesus. Okay. And then which leads us to, to prayer. And, um, and really from here... I just want to remind you of, of Jesus' teaching in Luke 11. I mean, the Lord just really made it clear to me through the week that um, in, in the body of Christ, in the church, you know, there's a lot of voices um, that seek to train church leaders, you know, in, in uh, expertise, in efforts, in strategies and methods for doing church, for growing church, for making disciples, for, you know, leading small groups for teaching, for preaching, all this sort of stuff. And it's all, it's all good and it's all worthwhile and all beneficial, but um, with the events of, of what's going on in the world today, I think now more than ever, church leaders and, and all of us included, um, really what we need to grow is in how to pray. <laughs> we actually, that's our bread and butter. It always has been. It's never stopped being prayer. Prayer, prayer is this chief weapon that the Lord has given us just so beautifully. For what, you know, for however it works, I'm not sure. He hears our prayers. There's mystery in it. Some prayers go seemingly unanswered. But I think principally through prayer, the Lord invites us to know him, to hear his voice, to, to walk in his ways, um, to find peace, to strengthen ourselves. And so we're going to spend a few minutes in prayer in a moment together. I'll give you some directions for that. But just as, just as a lead-in for that, um, let me just remind you again, as, um, as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, it begins, uh, Luke 11, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say... Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. This is the Luke's, you know, shortened version. And I love it. It's simple. It's practical. It's repeatable. And as we've often shared from the front here, that the Lord's Prayer wasn't given for the church to recite word for word, but rather as a pattern for prayer. And so I just want to encourage you in your prayer going forward from today um, in, in just some strategy in how you might pray. And it's an acronym, P-R-A-Y. It's borrowed from uh, Lectio Divina from the 24-7 folk, Pete Gregg. And uh, P simply stands for pause. Father. And then pause. And at that point, you might just, again, just recite the names of God. Adonai, Yeshua, Yahweh, Father. Just breathe in and breathe out. Pause. All the voices, all the, all the clamorous sounds and you know, distractions and needs of the world, just put them aside as you pause in his presence. And allow those next, those next lines, those next thoughts, just kind of to float in your prayer as well. You know, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. I mean, if, 
we just prayed that, that's amazing. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. That is, even that is a reset, yeah? But the R then stands for rejoice. And rejoicing is where thanksgiving and praise intersect. I went to his courts with thanksgiving. I went to his gates with praise. Where praise and thanksgiving intersect, we find rejoicing. And we can rejoice even, even in even in the world as it is today, even, even with the attacks on Israel, even with what's going on and all the questions, we are still commanded to rejoice. So we rejoice in him. A is for ask. Give us this day our daily bread. Asking can include everything from asking for peace all the way across the world, for God's will to be done, Right down to, Lord, I'm running late and I really need a car park in this supermarket. Everything in between is valid to ask. And why is simply to yield. Forgive me my sins. Forgive us our sins. As we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation. Lord, I yield my right to get even with those who have wronged me. I yield my, my own will, my own agenda. I, I yield my, my tendency to find my way into temptation. Lead me not, Lord, I pray. I yield. I yield fear. I yield selfish ambition. And I pray from this place of peace and love. And I look to you. And if that can be helpful, for you moving forward, then utilize it. Pause, rejoice, ask, and yield. Right now, we're going to spend about 10 minutes in prayer together. And um, the way I'm going to do this is I'm just going to, in a moment, ask you to stand. If, if you're new here, if you're visiting here for the first time, um, I acknowledge that you may feel uncomfortable or awkward. That's OK. If you're a part of the house and you see someone who's new, just gently invite them in to be part of your little prayer huddle. I'm just going to ask you to get into groups of three and four and, and to spend some time in prayer. We want to pray for Israel. We have been praying for Israel. We will continue to pray for Israel. We'll pray for the purposes of God to continue to unfold. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the IDF soldiers. We pray for everything that's going on. And, and just as the Lord leads you, pray, pray, pray. We, we've shared about the covenant signing in Jerusalem, uh, which would be happening today, yesterday, today, the 14th in Jerusalem, which, was, which has probably happened already. Um, I'm just getting my time zone sorted. And just to, again to remind you, that was for indigenous believers from all around the world, from every nation, to go to Jerusalem and to sign a covenant with the God of Israel. Yeah together with Israel. We don't know how many have made it there or who's there, but we trust that God knows and that he's working in that mystery. So lift that up to the Lord. My heart's really been for this nation as well and uh, the, a resounding no yesterday. And so what's not enshrined in the Constitution, Lord, may reconciliation be enshrined in our hearts. Yep, yeah, because it's actually a spirit of God thing. It's not a legislation thing or a constitutional thing. It's got to actually be on the hearts of Australians everywhere, so we so lift up our nation. Yeah. And so I'm going to ask you to stand and just get in groups of three or four. And I mean, I've just shared some, some things that you can pray over, but don't be limited to that. And just as the Lord leads, we encourage you just to engage in prayer for the next yeah, eight, nine, ten minutes or so. Go to work. Oh, hang on.
Amen. Father, all the concerns, all the issues, all the opportunities we raise before you, Father, this morning, confident, Lord, that you are the God in heaven who hears our prayers, that you are the one who responds in absolute love, Father God, and, and you are willing and you are acting out your purposes on the earth today. We lift up to you all the questions, all the concerns, all everything on our hearts, Lord God, and entrust them to your care in the name of Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Amen.